29th Sunday in Ordinary Time. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord to his anointed Cyrus, whose right hand I grasp, subduing nations before him and making kings run in his service, opening doors before him and leaving the gates unbarred. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, of Israel, my chosen one, I have called you by your name, giving you a title, though you knew me not. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. It is I who arm you, though you know me not, so that toward the rising and the setting of the sun people may know that there is none besides me. I am the Lord. There is no other. The Word of the Lord. reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the Church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, remembering you in our prayers, unceasingly calling to mind your work of faith and labor of love, and endurance in hope of our Lord Jesus Christ, before our God and Father, knowing, brothers and sisters loved by God, how you were chosen. For our gospel did not come to you in word alone, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with much conviction. The Word of the Lord. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. The Pharisees went off, and plotted how they might entrap Jesus in speech. They sent their disciples to him, 
with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are a truthful man, and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And you are not concerned with anyone's opinion, for you do not regard a person's status. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it lawful to pay the census tax to Caesar or not? Knowing their malice, Jesus said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin that pays the census tax. They handed him the Roman coin. He said to them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? They replied, Caesar's. At that he said to them, Then repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. The Gospel of the Lord. The first reading is from Isaiah 45, verse 1, and verses 4 to 6. Isaiah 45 is part of Deutero-Isaiah, chapters 40 to 55, that were written during the Babylonian exile. And in this passage, the prophet says that Cyrus, the king of Persia, is God's anointed one. Notice the universalism that God could choose a pagan to fulfill his will. And what was his will? That the people of, of Israel would return to their homeland. They would return from their exile. In fact, when Cyrus became the king of Babylon, he released all of the exile populations to return to their homeland. And he did this for the people of Israel. God is the God of all people, and God can use all people to fulfill his will. The second reading is from 1 Thessalonians 1, 1 to 5b. We hear that Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy are writing the Church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, who actually wrote this letter? Was it Paul, Silvanus, or Timothy? Only later in the letter does Paul actually say, I, Paul. From the introduction to the letter, we wouldn't know because those names are in alphabetic order. It could simply be the way he put it. But even though Paul wrote this letter, almost all of the letter is written in the first person plural, we, as if this was a group of people writing the letter. He writes to the Church of the Thessalonians. The word in Greek for church is ekklesia, which means the assembly. Now this could be almost any type of assembly. It could be a bowling club. But this is the church in God the Father. Remember, it's Jesus who taught us that God is Abba, Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ being the title in Greek, Messiah, which means the Anointed One, and Lord, the name used for God in the Old Testament, now applied to Jesus to show that Jesus is divine. Notice it doesn't mention the Holy Spirit. It's not that Paul didn't believe in the Holy Spirit, but he might have been trying to work out exactly who the Holy Spirit was. And in fact, in passages in this letter that speak about the Holy Spirit, that Greek phrase could also be interpreted as the Spirit of the Holy One, meaning the spiritual presence of Jesus after he had ascended into heaven. Paul begins a thanksgiving, and this is something new added to the Greek format of letters. Normally, you have five elements to the letters, who's sending it, who they're sending it to, a greeting, the body of the letter, and a closing salutation. Paul adds a sixth element, a thanksgiving. And this thanksgiving is extensive. Three chapters, 60% of the letter. Paul has to remind the community that even though they're succeeding, they shouldn't attribute their success to their own efforts. It's thanks to God's intervention that they've met the success. He doesn't want them to become arrogant. He speaks about their work of faith, labor of love, endurance, and hope. The three theological virtues, faith, hope, and love. This is the first time that we see these three together in biblical literature. And he speaks about how they are brothers and sisters chosen by God. In the Old Testament, the chosen were the Jewish people. He's writing to a mostly Gentile Christian audience. They are now the chosen ones. The Gospel is from Matthew 22, 15 to 21. The Pharisees and Herodians, Herodians are those who are followers of Herod, more a political party than a religious, try to trap Jesus. 
And they say, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Now, if Jesus says, yes, you should pay the taxes, then they could accuse Jesus of collaborating with an occupying power. If he says no, then they can accuse him before the governor that he's against Caesar. What does he do? He asks for a coin. Now, the fact that they're carrying a coin with the image of Caesar on it shows that they're hypocrites. Because here they're speaking against Caesar. They're talking about the authority of God. And they themselves have an image of Caesar on their person. What does Jesus say? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. That, yes, we should obey civil authority because all authority comes from God. But yet there is a time when we have to obey God before civil authority. Think of Nazi Germany. Think of situations in our own country in which at times there are laws which dehumanize people. Laws that are evil and we have to combat in any way that we can in gospel love. And may God bless us.